Welcome to today's webinar, Electronic Project Information Tracking, presented by Eric Law of EA Docs and David Susan of HDR Engineering. Please submit all questions to the chat panel in the lower left of your screen. Eric and David may choose to answer relevant questions as they come in, but may defer them until the end of the presentation. If you are seeking continuing education credits, please complete the attendance form at www.cmaanet.org forward slash webinar attendance within 48 hours of completing this webinar. I will now turn the webinar over to Eric and David. Thank you, Joe. Uh, as, there, uh, as Joe mentioned, this is electronic project information tracking, uh, tracking from an engineer and owner perspective. Uh, back in November when we gave this presentation to the CMAA group, uh, we had uh, the owner present as well. Unfortunately, he was not able to make it. So I will be uh, trying to fill in as the owner's uh, perspective as well. Uh, as Joe mentioned, my name is David Sisson. I'm an engineer with HDR Engineering. And I'll also be presenting with Eric Law. He's the founder and CEO of EA Dot. Currently, I'm working on a project it's called the Army Base Treatment Plan Improvement Phase 3 project. This job is located in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, we uh, currently uh, are about two years into the project, and we are using the electronic document management software EA Doc. Uh, we decided to use this uh, software because we were looking for a way to transfer and communicate files between the contractor, the engineer, and the owner. Um, also, we are looking for a way to effectively track these documents, submittals, requests for information. Uh, change orders, change proposal requests, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, we're also looking for an effective way to store and file each of these documents so that we were able to uh, efficiently uh, locate these files at a later date if we ever needed to uh, do that. And I'd also like to add, I'm, I'm presenting out of a, a field office trailer on a construction site, so I apologize for any uh, construction traffic that you may or may not hear in the background. Okay, back to the project. Uh, here's some few project numbers to give you a sense of the size. Uh, it's originally bid at a little over $78 million. We've processed uh, one point, almost $1.7 million in change orders, and that's through uh, through the present date. Uh, so that brings a con uh, current construction cost to a little over $80 million. Um, as I said, we're just over two years into construction. The notice to proceed was issued May 3rd, 2010. Uh, substantial completion is scheduled for uh, 2014 with the contract uh, final completion date set for June of 2014. So looking into this, there's a lot of project coordination that is required. Uh, as I mentioned, there's many different uh, types of documents that we need to track, uh, communicate to the contractor, inspectors, and uh, the, the review team that's outside of the field office. And we need to a way to effectively transfer and communicate these documents to others. Uh, Originally, the, uh, the, the project was bid as hard copy submittals. Uh, with notice to proceed in May, we, uh, we decided to change to a type of electronic, change to electronic documents, and we had to figure out a way to how to manage and track these documents. Initially, we had set up a FTP site. Uh, somewhat internal to HDR that other that outside users were able to access and, and load files. I'm sure many of you know how that works. But we did have uh, not difficulty, but there was uh, it was somewhat difficult to, to get outside users access. Um, from the owner's standpoint, they weren't really submitting or uh, submitting any documents, but they wanted the ability to pull the documents off of this FTP site and uh, store for their records. Um, this, was, this was not able, this was, appeared to be a challenge. So we 
we uh, we decided to go another route. So from the FDP site, we had that from May to about August. So we went through the summer of 2010, uh, where the contractor would submit an email uh, notifying us that uh, that a document had been placed on the FTP site. We would have to go in there, pull the document off, uh, get that ready for processing to our to our review team, whether it be a submittal or an RFI. And then we would have to drop it back on FTP site and notify the contractor. Um, also, in the process of that, we we had to create our own uh, internal. We had our own internal tracking log, uh, where we would have to manually input each of these uh, these parts of the process to where we received this, what it was, what date we received it, you know, due dates, uh, review actions, and then dates that went back to the contractor. And this this proved to be somewhat cumbersome in, in that effort. So in August August of 2010, we decided to go to uh, uh, collaborative uh, software to to communicate and transfer and uh, track all these documents. And on this slide, I'm trying to show show some things to consider when what we considered when we were implementing this uh, software. Uh, first one is acceptance and buy-in, and, and I've listed the three parties: owner, contractor, and engineer, because all all three parties will be using this uh, this software. Uh, the contractor needs to buy in because they're the ones that go in there and you know, put in the submittal or RFI or or whatever it is on the site, um, and through this they are able to link all their documents or to a drawing or to a specification to let you know. Um, if things are if are being changed, um, or any 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 kind of relation in that matter, um, the uh, engineer needs to have buy-in because as as we are the controllers, we 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 help set things up. Uh, we need to have buy-in because we're we've accepted this software and you know we're we're also transmitting documents to the owner and back to the contractor. Uh, another item to consider is cost. Uh, there, of course, there is a cost for the software, but there also is a cost with hard copy submittals. I mean, um, as specified, this this job is set up to each time the contractor would submit a submittal or shop drawing, they would have to submit six of them, six hard copies, and uh, you know that that became a pretty high processing time for all these shop drawings where we would receive six. Uh, six copies, and we would have to distribute whether it's you know to three reviewers that one could be in North Carolina, one could be in California, and and so on, and then getting all these submittals back and compiling them all. That there's just a considerable amount of processing time at that. Um, and with electronic documents, we're able to just um, email these or 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 uh, submit them through EA Doc to a reviewer, and then they can submit it back to us. And uh, we were able to just copy and paste, um, copy and paste comments on shop drawings or, or requests for information. Um, the next next item to consider is uh, selection of software. Um, I'd recommend looking into a web-based system because you really only need an inter internet access, whether it be Internet Explorer or another recognized uh, 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 web. Uh, Web browser, because our IT between the owner, contractor, and engineer, we each have our own IT department, and it seems like it's very difficult to uh, to have someone else's software downloaded onto uh, onto another computer, and that's that's where we faced it. Uh, that's where we faced difficulty as well. When implementing the uh, the Project uh, document management system. Uh, of course, we went to the web-based system, so there was really no implementation there. It's just we received a link from EA Doc, and, and uh, we we created an account, a user account. It's not 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 difficult. Uh, we went through initial training. We had initial training set up uh, to where we learned the basics of the program, and then we were able to work with uh, EA Doc support group. 
and uh, we were able to customize customize the software per our project's needs or our own personal preferences to make things more efficient. And uh, of course, we we also had time allotted for follow up training. This is helpful when you learn parts of the system and you want to be able to learn more, or if you bring new users or new employees into the mix, it's always it's always beneficial to have them go through training on this. So a little comparison of how to process and manage all types of documents. Like I said, hard copy documents, uh, there's a higher quantity of copies for each document. You know, shop drawings, we required six. Um, electronic documents, it's, it's just one. The contractor gets one document together and submits that one document to you. And of course, you're able to copy and, and uh, manage it however you would like to do that way. Um, hard copy documents, we had maintenance of individual tracking logs, and this became very, uh, very time, uh, it took a lot of time to uh, maintain and update the tracking logs each time we received a submittal. Uh, send it to a reviewer or reviewers, received it back, and sent it to the contractor. With uh, the software that we're using, the, the tracking of documents is integral with the software. So it's, as soon as you click send to, to send it to a reviewer, it's, it's being tracked. Then, like I said, the time to process and compile and uh, prepare documents to return. Uh, this is a considerable effort uh, for for us in the field office pulling together all the reviews. Um, with electronic documents, this step still occurs, but it seems uh, seems a little bit more efficient because we're able to copy and paste. Um, and then hard copy documents. There's a all these documents had to be filed. And we were able to save considerable filing space out here in the field office by going to electronic documents. And these are some of the electronic documents that, that we have on the job. Uh, currently, we have a little over 220 specifications, approximately 900 drawings, um, over 800 shop drawings. Well, Almost 20 O and M manuals, and that's going to be uh, increasing here very soon as uh, more equipment arrives arrive on site. Um, over 420 RFIs, requests for information, um, 33 field orders, and 77 change orders or, or CPRs that are to become change orders. And uh, with with a with a software such as EA Doc, we're able to when we issue a field order. We're able to identify each drawing that is impacted by that field order. So if anything changes on that field order, we can link a draw, link that field order to a drawing, and and we'll, we will know what has changed on that. And that that becomes very beneficial because, as you can see, we've issued quite a few changes or revisions, and uh, and looking back, trying to maintain the uh, most current set of drawings. It becomes difficult, but this helps out uh, when you're able to link a specific drawing to a change. And Eric, I'll turn it over to you now. Sounds good. Thanks, David. Uh, so I'm going to go through kind of a little bit of the usage, uh, what this team did with this software application for you guys. Um, and essentially, what this team was comprised of is HDR was acting as the owner's rep on this particular project, and they were also the design engineer for it as well. And so we've got that single organization here. Uh, HRSD, Hampton Roads Sanitation District, is the client. Archer Western was the general contractor. And then we can see that the general contractor brought on all their subcontractors to the system. Uh, and you can see here that there's over 40 organizations. The majority of these are subcontractors using EDOC to convey information to the prime contractor. And these 40 organizations are encompassing just over 100 users. Uh, and what's happened on this project team is all these subs are submitting their RFIs and submittals to the prime contractor for review. And then Archer Western is able to hit that submit button or send button and send it off to HDR. And then they can route it about internally. They can send it to the client and then compose that response and send it back to the contractor. And so this way, as that information is traveling across the team, the application is automatically logging it for them. So this way, nobody on the project has to maintain the Excel spreadsheets. Nobody has to maintain the FTP sites. The entire project team is using a single tool to move this information electronically. 
And what's great too here is HDR, all they had to do was set up Archer Western, give them their permissions for the RFIs and submittals, and then Archer Western was able to take those permissions and go ahead and bring on their subs, just as if it was their own application. They have complete control over their subcontractors, and so you get a lot of buy-in. You know, buy-in on these tools is very important, so you want to make sure there's benefits to all the parties involved. Uh, and Archer Western obviously saw that and brought on their subcontractors here to involve them in the process and get that information back and forth across the team. Uh, now, if HDR had been, say, uh, acting more as a CM with a separate design engineer that was an intern on this particular project, they'd be able to add them to the system as well as any other firms that they're working with and control the flow of information to those project participants. Now, some of the key uh, benefits here within the, the system, the electronic advantages to this team, you know, is the accountability, uh, the reporting on it. You know, anybody on this project team can run reports. They can see where that RFI is. They can see that submittal history. Uh, they can see who read it, who responded to it. It's all there for them. Uh, the relationship tracking, you know, like David was mentioning, I want to be able to track uh, PCR. I want to see the RFIs related to it. I want to see the submittals tied to it. You can do all that through the software application. So you get a lot more benefits with a collaborative PM tool than you do with, say, the Excel spreadsheets or the FTP sites. Uh, the efficiency gains uh, for you guys. Obviously, implementing a tool, you expect to cut down the time. You know, let the engineers focus on engineering work and not doing a lot of that manual document logging and tracking the information on the projects. Uh, the accessibility components, giving them instant access to the information using the search functionality. Uh, and then data reuse, you know, being able to reuse this information over and over again. Uh, so when we dive into the accountability component of it, you know, you can take a look at an audit log here for a particular submittal. So they can see exactly when the contractor created the revision for the submittal, uh, when they submitted it back to HDR here and their team. I can see all the users that read it, who's approved it, who put notes on it. It's all automatically tracked for you guys. Traditionally, this is all done in an Excel spreadsheet. And so this team took that laborious task of manually tracking all this information and automated it all with the application rolling out on their particular project. And you can see it all related to the submittals. It's got the version control. You know, everything about this job is tracked here for these guys. So when this project is completed, they can turn all this over to the client. And it's very easy and efficient. They don't have to go back through all their banker's boxes. They don't have to go through the filing cabinets. It's all here in the system so they can turn over a flash drive or a DVD set to their clients and say, hey, here's all the submittals, the RFIs, here's all our project records for closeout. It's going to make it much more efficient for this team when this job does wrap up. When we take a look at that reporting ability, you know, David can log into the system. He can see all his current pending submittals. He can see priorities. He can see days outstanding. And all this is automatically done just by hitting that refresh or the run button here in the system and running those reports for you guys. Uh, so again, you know, we're saving David time on these projects so he can focus on the quality control, making sure the job is being built right for the client and not on the paperwork and all the administrative science and of managing these jobs. Uh, the ability to measure the performance. You know, you want to be able to keep track of RFI turnaround time, submittal review time, change order processing time on these projects. And so with the system, David can keep tabs. You know, is he getting submittals back to the contractor on time? Is he getting the RFIs back to the contractor on time? What are the min and max turnaround times? You know, all these analytics and statistics are being generated automatically for him. All he has to do is click on the statistics tab and it'll tell him exactly how his project's performing. Uh, and then from here, he can even set up alerts and notifications uh, to tell him about information that hasn't met his requirements. So you can plug in, you know, that contract requirement that says, hey, a submittal has to be turned around in 15 or 21 days, RFIs have to be turned around in seven days. And so the software is watching that for you, you know, and so it's notifying them, hey, this RFI is outstanding eight days, or this submittal is at 20 days, it's getting close. And these are all some of the great things that you can do with these applications that were traditionally done more with manual uh, processes with the Excel spreadsheets and with some Outlook notes and so forth. Um, and then some of the more powerful tools and functionality out there are these relationship tracking. You know, the, the common uh, theme with every project is when you're setting up your project tracking system is prepare for a claim. You know, every good project engineer and project manager wants to set up their document controls, their project controls to expect a claim on the project. We all hope it never happens, but we always have to prepare for the worst. And so with these tools, by being able to track all the data, if you do end up in the claim situations or change order situations, then you're going to be able to take that information and you can run it into relationship diagrams. So just by tracking all your information, the RFIs, the submittals, the communication, the field orders here, all tied back to my change proposal, then I can run these relationship diagrams. And so I get some powerful reporting capabilities that David can use to come in and say, hey, you know, 
when the owner comes back to him and says, hey, how did you guys get to change proposal request number nine? He can say, okay, well, it's part of change order five. He says, here's the specs that were affected by this change. Here's the failed orders that we were initiating uh, tied back to that change. And here's some specifications and RFIs that tie back into those particular field orders. So he gets a graphical relationship that he can explain to the owners and the project team that says, you know, here's how we ended up at this change. Here's why it occurred on this project which is an excellent tool for after a project, an owner can go back and say, hey, you know, this spec section caused a lot of change orders. Let's revise it before the next project. And so by having this information electronically already in the system, these reports are automatically generated for them. And so there's no manual data entry or re-entering this information form on these jobs. So when we take a look at the efficiencies, you know, you want to look at improving the efficiency across the entire project team. You don't want to push the inefficiencies and risk around. You actually want to eliminate it from the project. Uh, you know, traditionally, a lot of times you would see owners and CMs push this inefficiency of the labor task, attracting this information down to contractors. They push it to their designers, their consultants. Uh, with these more collaborative applications, you're actually eliminating those inefficiencies from your project team. You're getting rid of the manual document tracking for the owner. You're getting rid of it for the HDR, in this case, who's the design engineer and the owner's uh, manager on this project. You're getting rid of it for the contractors, the subcontractors. Getting rid of that inefficiency across the entire team results in substantial time and cost savings for everybody, which really helps with buy-in because everybody sees the time and uh, savings here as Archer Western did and got all their subs on board, uh, and it results in a better project for the client. Uh, you're eliminating data reentry. You know, traditionally the contractor had their own tool, HDR would have their own tool, owner would have their own, designers would have their own, and so everybody's re-entering this data over and over again. Um, and that leads to errors. You know, people make keystroke, uh, everybody fat fingers once in a while, so it leads to errors in those logs and mistakes, uh, lost information, and can potentially lead to claims on the project. You're also eliminating the filing cabinet search. Like David was talking about earlier, they've got a lot more real estate available on their trailer because they don't have those, all those filing cabinets. The other thing, too, is they've got the ability to do keyword searches on this information. So instead of, you know, searching through the filing cabinet of submittals, you know, he's got 400 and something submittals on the project, he can punch in the word pipe and search all of his submittals that have the word pipe in it. You know, he can say, hey, I want to find all the stainless steel pipe submittals. Pops it up there on his screen for him instantaneously. Uh, and then accessibility. Obviously, today you've got the project team at the job site, but then you've got people in your main offices, you've got designers in other offices spread out throughout the country. All these teams are very distributed. You know, there's even project teams where members are in different locations around the world. Uh, with collaborative web-based applications, you know, everybody's got access to that information as long as they have an internet connection. It could be the inspector out in the field with the tablet, it could be the project engineer in the office, or it could be the executive back in the uh, HDR's headquarters. They can all log in and check on this particular project and see real-time information. And so you can see here with some of the efficiencies, um, you know, like I was talking about the, the pipe search. You know, I can bring up submittals, pile logs, pictures, anything related to the word pipe can display here instantly. If I had to do this with filing cabinets, this could take a week plus. And these are some of the powerful benefits of having all this information in one tool for you guys. Um, accessibility we talked about. Uh, the nice thing about these web-based applications is you can get to them any browser, any internet connection. You know, it could be an inspector in the field with their tablets. It could be an iPad. It could be a uh, Samsung Galaxy tablet. As long as it's got an internet connection, that inspector's got instant access to project information. And so they can see exactly, you know, the current submittals, the current RFIs, change orders. That inspector doesn't have to go back and forth between the trailer and the field especially when you get on some of these large civil projects where your project site can be spread out over, you know, 20, 30 miles for, say, a pipeline job, this becomes an incredibly valuable tool, giving the inspectors access to their data. Um, you know, with the web information, it's just a website. So, you know, as long as you've got access to uh, an Internet connection, you've got browser, Firefox, IE, Google's Chrome, you've got access to your project data. Uh, and then the re data reuse components, you know, enter once and never again. You know, a subcontractor creates a submittal, we want to reuse that content over and over again. You know, the general contractor does their review, they're going to put their comments on it, goes to HDR, they're going to respond back to it. Nobody is re-entering that original submittal information. Once that sub puts it in the system, then everybody's going to review that information as it goes across the team. And this gives each project participant the ability to share it with the necessary reviewers. You know, the contractors, they don't know where that smell is going to go to review. All they know is they're going to turn this smell over to HDR, and it's going to go to a group of engineers who are going to comment on it. It could be one engineer, it could be ten engineers. The contractor doesn't know, but they know when they send it to HDR, they're going to get a response back. 
And then HDR is able to take that submittal and they can distribute it. They can say, hey, I need owner comments from the operations and maintenance team. I need a special consultant's comments. I need my internal engineer's comments. Each participant can send out those uh, submittals for the next step of review, and then the comments will come back to HDR. They can compile those comments and send their final set back to the contractor. And then the contractor can distribute to their subs. The other thing about data reuse is all this information is being tracked electronically. You know, like David mentioned, the O&M manuals. You're tracking warranties, test reports. All this data is going to need to be used again in the operations and maintenance of this plant. Uh, so once HDR and Archer Western are done with this project, you know, they're going to go on to the next one. But the owner, Hampton Roads, they're going to have to operate this plant for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And so all that data can be turned over to them electronically, so this way they can have all the information there in the system form. Uh, this way there's no need for them to you know, go through the banker's boxes, there's not storing hard copies in a basement of an operations building. It's all there electronic, so they can load it into their operations and maintenance system, they can distribute it to their techs, whatever they need to do with it, they can do it very easily. Again, they're reusing that information. They don't have to scan it in, they don't have to copy it, it's all there for them to use again. So now what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, turn it back over to David, where he's going to talk about um, some of the key benefits here for you guys on this project. Thanks, Eric. And uh, I see where some questions have been coming in, and uh, we're we're nearing the end of the presentation. So if you guys want to go ahead and uh, submit a few questions, so we know that there's not a delay. And I, I apologize in advance if we uh, miss miss questions, because we're also getting all the uh, the joined and the left, uh, the people that have left as well with the questions. So back to the presentation, uh, little recommendations for keys to success. Um, first one would be early implementation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did not start this project with uh, electronic documents or the EA doc software. And we were, we were caught behind the eight ball with that. It, it was a beneficial move regardless, but we, the earlier you implement uh, the software and the electronic documents in the project, the better off it will be. Again, there's team buy-in. Uh, you got to get the engineer, owner, and contractor on board. Um, if you if it's a if it's a bid project, you know the contractor would have to buy in during the during the bid. He'll understand that during the bid phase. Uh, but we we in our project we had to uh, have a few discussions and. It turned out to be beneficial for them, and they never really uh, resisted, but we just had to make sure that they were on board. Um, knowledge of system capabilities. Uh, we received some recommendations from others in HDR that have used the EA Doc software, so we had a little internal knowledge of the capabilities there. And then through discussions with Eric and uh, EA Doc support team, they were able to fill us in on any questions that we had. Um, also, training. Uh, we we initially had training that that we went through, and then we had some follow up training. Again, that that was for um, for for us who who had more questions and maybe wanted to see some more advanced features, or or for for new personnel coming onto the project team um, after we had already started. Uh, again, team buy in is, is critical, and uh, this. This slide here just shows the uh, the communication uh, for the, for the project. Uh, the red lines show that the contractor can uh, submit and communicate to the engineer and owner through EA Doc, and uh, this is just the file transfer. So the contractor can uh, put in files; we can take them out, vice versa, and uh, the owner can also extract them. And through this project, we show the owner going back to the engineer, just because we're we're not a Third-party uh, CM. We are we are representing the owner in this case. A couple lessons learned. Uh, again, th these go back. These relate to the keys to success. You know, start early. That's uh, that's always beneficial. Uh, and we're learning as we go. We're able to work with the EA Doc support team and uh, modify or add tabs for whatever purposes we may need. Um, and it, that was pretty seamless uh, to do so. And again, follow-up training. I'm, I'm sure there's still more things that, out there that I can learn about EA Doc that, that I don't know. Uh, so of course, always recommend uh, more training. And that concludes the uh, presentation. And I guess now, Eric, you and I can go through the uh, the questions if you'd like.
Yeah, so we've got about uh, 20 questions that are already posted here with you guys. So I'm going to go back uh, to the first ones here that we got early on in the presentation. Um, the first one was from Roderick Charles. Uh, did web-based required full-time computer tech to manage the system? Um, this particular application was hosted for HDR. Um, so all they needed was web, web browsers. Um, I don't know what kind of support you guys had, David, besides yourself on the project, if you want to comment on that. No, it, I mean, just our regular IT. I mean, it, as long as we had Internet access, we were good to go. I, I believe all the, all the support came on your end, and that was um, included as part of the service. Uh, the second question we got uh, is a plotter, large scale printer uh, required to provide on site trailer hard copies. So I'll let you answer that one, David. Did you guys have any oh, plotters, or how did you guys did you guys we, have any full size plots? Uh, we we do not. Uh, that that would be beneficial for our case, uh, just because it's always it's good to have a, a set of hard copy documents around one. Um, but we do not have that in our case, and I, I think that's something that maybe we would consider just for printing out select drawings. Um, but other than that, we're 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 all electronic. And like you mentioned, you had uh, you mentioned tablets in your presentation. We do have an inspector using a tablet, and he's able to access anything out there in the field, whether it's shop drawings or submittals or uh, drawings or specifications, and that that. That's proved to be a very handy tool. Excellent. Um, question from Michael Green: Do you still require one hard copy for record on the job? Is that required for you guys, David? No, we we do not require that. Uh, I mean, you cannot. We we just if we need it, we just print off a hard copy, and that saves that saves printing off everyone or still or still processing just one hard copy. Uh, so it's more of a as as needed basis. But I mean, every project's different. If I mean, that, that's something that everyone can agree on before they can set it up that way. Uh, the next question has uh, come in from uh, Nam Kwam. Uh, he's asking about the uh, how are the metadata entered in the system? Each document individually or auto through some sort of scanner? Uh, so the metadata is entered into forms. Um, so HDR would customize the SMETL forms and the RFI forms at the beginning of the project. And then the subcontractor, whoever is creating that information, would fill out that particular form, and then they would upload, you know, CAD drawings, pictures, videos, schedule files, whatever they need to submit with that smell would be an attachment that would go through the system uh, for the HDR and their team to review. Uh, the next question here, uh, Dwayne asks, which tab had the full drawing log? Um, within our system, the full drawing log is uh, underneath the green document section. There's actually a tab for that where you can run a report. Um, and see all the documents and drawings there on the particular project uh, for you guys. Uh, training, Roderick Charles, uh, training everyone. This can be more than a handful. How did you handle? Um, David, on this project, uh, how much training did you guys do and the contractor? How did you guys handle that? Well, we initially set it up. I, I think it was an hour or two uh, program with your support team. And he just went through the basics, you know, showing how to um, upload shop drawings and, and transmit them and, and receive them and, and, you know, searching the system. Um, I really didn't have too much training. I, I kind of self-taught my, myself. And uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's pretty easy navigating. So I, if, if you're used to electronic uh, software, it's, difficult. Yeah, typically um, from our perspective, we'll train um, the owner, owner's rep, prime contractor, we'll train that core team on the EDOC system. Um, and then what they'll be responsible for is, you know, any sub consultants, any suppliers, um, they'll take care of training for them. Uh, so for example, Bruce Gordon's question here, how do you deal with the lower tier team members, subcontractors uh, that do not embrace this technology? Um, you know, it's up to the general contractors. Uh, we've seen general contractors put it in their specs that says every sub has to submit the information electronically to them, and they'll define how that is. Um, and a lot of subs are embracing it. You know, you look at your MEP guys, um, you know, especially, you know, they've got large volumes of submittals, large volumes of shop drawings. They want to do it electronically. 
um, especially when you start getting into O&M manuals and warranties and test reports. Um, they definitely want to do it digitally. Um, and you really want to ask yourself, do you want an electrical contractor you know, building a treatment plant that can't send an email or generate information electronically from their job site? You know, how well are they going to do with a SCADA implementation? Um, so a lot of contractors are saying, hey, you know, our teams are qualified, we're professionals, we know electronic tools, this is not a big deal. And we actually find a lot of the contractors are driving the, the means to go electronic. There's a huge cost savings for them there. Um, Thomas Shively, uh, what is the cost per user? Um, with our particular product, there is no cost per user. Uh, the EDOC subscription is based on the construction value of the project, um, and so HDR procured the subscription for this particular job, and then they are free to add all their users. So this way, when they set up Archer Western, they give Archer Western their permissions, and they don't care how many people Archer Western has. They have complete control over their subs, uh, and then the subs can even add secondary subs and suppliers below them as well. Uh, let's see, Thomas Shively had uh, another question here. Uh, how much uh, customer setup is required uh, is the question that came in from Thomas here. Um, it, it's going to depend. Um, so within the system, we've got standard forms for R5, submittals, change orders, pay apps, all that for you guys. Um, and then it's based on how much customization is required of those forms to meet your client's requirements. You know, how many custom fields do you need? What changes do you guys need? Um, I would say on average, it's somewhere between two to three weeks to set up and train a customer. Um, David, for this particular project, do you remember how long it took us to customize your site and train you? I know it was short because you guys were on a time crunch. Yeah, it, it was. It wasn't long at all. And I mean, we continue to work with your support team to uh, to customize the software, you know, for our project needs. But it was it was virtually seamless. Yeah. Yeah, and you can always make changes on down the road too. You know, I mean, nothing's ever set in stone. These projects are always, as time moves over, you know, when you start to use different functionality, like when you go into punch list and those closeout close out phases, there's always going to be some tweaks to the system as you start to use new features in the tool. Uh, another question from Thomas: uh, Does it handle invoicing? Uh, yeah, within the system, you can have the contractors submit their pay estimates based on their approved schedule values, um, and this way. Uh, it'll also take into account the change orders. So this way, when David approves, you know, uh, change orders, it's going to update the pay estimate forms uh, for the contractor, so they can bill against it in the system. And then it updates, obviously, the financial summaries for you guys. Uh, let's see, Roderick Charles um, had a question here uh, about the user pricing in groups of 10 to 20. Um, it's the unlimited user, so it doesn't matter about groups or the number of uh, users you add. Just go ahead and use the system. Uh, Thomas Shively, you've got a question here. Do you use a work group, i.e., document control group? Um, so I think what this question is, is this probably going to be aimed towards you, David. Did you guys have a central group that received all the RFIs and submittals and then assigned them out to the actual reviewers, or how did you guys handle that process? Yes, well, we, since we are representing the design team and the construction management team, we, uh, we were the core, so we received all submittals, all requests for information. Uh, we would review them in-house and also ship them out to other reviewers as part of HDR. Thanks, uh, The next question here from Linnea Gallagher. When making the decision to use electronic document controls, what other programs, tools did you look at, and what about this program made it your pro program of choice? As far as when I mean, we decided to use this program, I, I was not completely involved in the selection. However, I do know that we received some recommendations from um, other HDR individuals that have successfully used this, uh, the EA Doc software. And so we, we were on a time crunch, as mentioned, so uh, I don't think we did too much research in other, in other programs. So um, we just went with the recommendations of other HDR members. Question here from Michael Langan: uh, Who maintains files after a project is completed? I'll send this one to you, David. Well, when uh, after the completion of the project, I believe we get some type of file from you, whether it be a disk or uh, a thumb drive or however that's being transmitted. Then we're we're able to keep that software. And correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, but it functions just as it does now, except you don't need internet access? That's correct. 
And uh, then we're able to extract those files. And from from the owner standpoint, they have their own uh, file management system, and they're able to extract extract all documents and upload to their system. And and they're and they're doing so probably every three or six months, just so that they're not uh, overwhelmed at the end of the project. And, and typically, most of our other clients too. You know, when we're working with uh, firms like HDR, um, you know, when the project finishes out, they'll have the deliverable to the client to give them everything, and then they'll have their own records that they'll store for HDR's records as well, based on their document retention policy. Uh, and then we'll deliver that all to them. Uh, when we're working directly with agencies, uh, typically we'll keep it on our system from seven to ten years after the project's completed, depending on that agency's document retention requirements. Uh, so it's up to the client how long we need to keep it active in eDoc form. Uh, the next question here from uh, Nain Khan, uh, how much data can be stored electronically? Is there a limit on file sizes? Uh, they can store as much data as they process on the project. It's unlimited data storage. And the only limitation on file uploads is an individual file that has to be less than a half a gig in size or 512 megs per each individual file that they upload. Um, and so far to date, we haven't seen anybody hit that limit on the system. And that includes you know, BIM drawings, videos, audio files. You can move a lot of large uh, formatted files up onto the system. A uh, question here from Bruce Gordon. Uh, does this document control system require a naming convention be strictly followed in order to keep the documents in a logical order? Or do the documents wind up in an illogical order depending on who posts the entries? Uh, so this particular system has got a very structured tab system. So for example, all the submittal work is done in the submittal tab. Uh, and then the clients can choose the numbering scheme. Uh, so for example, with submittals, you can predefine the submittal numbers so the contractor is picking it off the list. Uh, so this way you can tell the contractor, you know, when you're submitting on 200 horsepower pumps, the contractor picks that particular submittal number from the mechanical section and then enters the data within the form. Uh, and then within the form data as well, you can go ahead and specify mandatory fields and optional fields. So you can really develop some high quality data input uh, systems to these forms to ensure that everything comes in a very structured, controlled format for you guys with this project. A uh, question here from Michael Green. <coughs> Can a folder of files be uploaded or only individual files? Uh, so for the first part of the question is you can drag and drop a folder of files. Uh, we have a drag and drop utility for moving things like drawings and specifications. Uh, you know, so when you're bringing data from other systems into our application, you can drag and drop that uh, using our drag and drop utility. And it just requires a little Java plugin installed in your browser to enable that drag and drop functionality. Um, the second part of the question, also can the file be marked up with Adobe on the site and saved, or do you have to download the file, mark it up, and re-upload? Re uh, with our particular application, you're going to have to download the file, mark it up with Adobe or Bluebeam, and then re-upload to the system. Uh, and you can do that through version control, revisions. We're going to track all the different iterations there for you, but the actual markup will be done in Adobe or Bluebeam for you guys. But you are able to uh, make comments on, on the software without having to upload. So if you don't have any, if you have just general comments, you're able to just uh, create those on the on the software in return without having to re-upload the, uh, the document. Correct. Yep. Excellent. Uh, the next question here from Dwayne, how will BIM files be handled? Uh, is there a viewer built into the system? Uh, so currently BIM files are handled just as in a CAD, a picture, or a video. You know, our system is file agnostic for you guys. Um, for you there, so this way you can upload Revit models. Uh, it can be a MicroStation format, um, you know, any of the Bentley's new BIM model formats, whatever you guys are moving for the BIM side. Uh, currently, there is not a viewer built in for those BIM files, so you will need to download it to view it. Um, look for that to change here in the next couple of years as the web browsers improve in functionality. Uh, with the new HTML5 standards, it's going to support the graphics rendering in the browsers, um, and so look for the viewers to show up in eDoc. I would say in the next one to two years for those BIM files, so you'll be able to see those in the application. A uh, question here from Marques Manson. <clears throat> Does anyone besides the user uh, who created the document have the capacity to modify documents within the system, or is user access restricted to certain functions? Um, so the way the eDoc application works is when a user creates a submittal, for example, once they hit the submit button, it becomes a read-only submittal. So people can add comments to it, they can respond to it, but nobody can mark up that uh, original submittal information or make changes to it. 
Uh, so what happens typically is a that user can recall it to make changes to it. Uh, but once it's submitted, it's going through the review process. It becomes a read-only document um, that people are working on. And so you've got some very good integrity there. Uh, and you can tr control those permissions. You know which users can actually create that submittal, who can actually send it, who can respond to it, who can approve it is all controlled at the permission level. Uh, and then the viewing of that submittal. You know when the contractor first turns that submittal into HDR, it's only seen by the contractor in HDR. Then HDR can send it to the client or the sub consultant, so wherever it needs to go next. And then once they have that act of sending it, then it gives them access to view it. So you've got a lot of control there at the individual document level. <laughs> so um, Ashok, I um, apologize if I'm going to butcher your last name here, Kandawal, um, he's asking how does uh, EDOC compare to Oracle's Primavera contract management? Um, have you used contract manager before, David? I have not, so I would not be a good source for that question. Okay. Uh, so in general, at a high level, Primavera's contract manager was designed for general contractors to track uh, expenses and information on their projects. It's designed for them to manually enter submittals and RFIs um, to generate reports. It is not a collaborative tool. Um, people will try and make it collaborative by adding on SharePoint and other applications, but by no means is it a collaborative PM application. It is a standalone enterprise project portfolio tool, or whatever Oracle is advertising as these days. It is definitely geared more towards the general contractors than it is construction managers and facility owners. <laughs> the EDOC application is designed for the opposite. It's designed for facility owners and CM engineering firms like HDR to manage information. And it's designed as a collaborative tool. Um, a perfect example of the differentiation in a collaborative tool versus a non-collaborative one is with Oracle Primavera Contract Manager. If HDR had procured it, they would have given access to the contractor through a portal. Uh, the contractor would not have been able to run reports. They would not have been able to add subcontractors or control the flow of information to them from their subs without procuring other software and doing an integration project. With EDOC, the general contractor has the full ability to run some other logs, RFI logs, customize their reports. They have the full ability to add their subs, and their subs can even add their suppliers below. Um, so that's really a huge difference. The EDOC application connects the entire team electronically to move data, whereas Primavera is more a standalone report generating tool to give you guys RFI and some other logs and graphics based on user data entry, and typically a lot of data reentry. Um, also, if you want to learn more about the differences between EDOC and Oracle's Primavera Contract Manager, <coughs> check out our website as well. Uh, www.eadocsoftware.com and we've got a comparison on there for you. Let's see. Um, Name Khan has got a question here. How are confidential documents controlled and prevented for unauthorized access? Um, did you guys have anything confidential on this particular project, David, that you guys restricted uh, access to? No, we did not. We did not? Okay. Um, so typically within the system, by default, everything is considered confidential. So for example, um, if David puts a comment on a submittal, he has to explicitly send that comment to the contractor or his reviewers for them to have access to it. Um, the way other clients will handle this is if they have confidential information, say communication between the owner and uh, engineer CM, they will restrict a tab in the application so it's only seen by those two parties. So this way nobody can even accidentally share information with a contractor. Uh, and so they'll set up an owner to CM communication tab that the only people that have access to it are those two particular parties. Uh, Dwayne has asked, will someone announce how to obtain the recording on this presentation? Um, I'm going to turn that over to Joe. Uh, if he's still on the line with CMAA to answer that one. Um, I'm here. And um, as far as obtaining the recording, uh, if you need it immediately, feel free to send me an email. All my contact information is on the CMA website. And again, my name is Joe. Um, but if you'd like to wait a couple of weeks, we will be posting a recording of the presentation online as long as the presenters are fine with that. Um, and you can find that in the past webinars page on our website. So if you go to the webinars page and scroll down to the bottom, you'll see the very bottom of the page is a link to past webinars, and that's where you can find that. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Um, Shelley has asked, how does this compare to SharePoint? So it, it's tough to make a comparison because SharePoint is a Microsoft platform that you can build your own solution on top of. 
So lots of different firms have taken the SharePoint platform and built their own project management tools, their own collaboration tools on top of. Um, so really it's, it's a blank slate that you can build with. Um, we've seen some really advanced and very powerful solutions and we've seen some very basic ones that you know, are a little more than an FTP site. Um, so in terms of that comparison, it's really up to what you guys want to build. Um, EDOX is an out-of-the-box collaborative construction project management application. SharePoint is an out-of-box collaboration platform that you can use to manage IT information, construction information, you know, landscaping, whatever you want to build out of it. So you can do some portals and things with that. Um, so in terms of that one, it's really what you want to build there. And if you have the resources to build your own application, then you'll see firms going with SharePoint, um, but just make sure you encompass the time and money to build that tool on that platform. Uh, Dennis uh, Eckel has asked, with EA being a collaborative tool, how is a CM guard against claims from contractors? Uh, expedition limits access to the contractors, therefore they are not able to run reports and use them against the owner. <laughs> um, so with expedition it just required that uh, more people use, um, and when it goes into litigation and claims, you just had to, um, you know, everything's discoverable. Whether it's an EDOC or Expedition or emailed, if you wrote it, if you said it, it's all discoverable. Uh, the big benefit of EDOC is it speeds up the flow of information and it's much more accountable. Uh, so when you go into a court and the courts are validating the, uh, the reliability of the data, um, an EDOC versus an Expedition, an EDOC will beat it out every time. Uh, with EDOC, nobody has the ability to edit databases. Um, all of our records cannot be modified. Uh, none of our customers have database level access. Um, with Expedition, and there are a couple court cases right now where owners are claiming contractors modified the databases, um, you have a validity issue on that data um, because the contractors can go in and make changes to those databases um, and edit those records. Um, <clears throat> so even though Expedition does limit the access to the contractors to run reports, it opens your project teams up to a lot of liability in terms of accuracy and records. Uh, with EDOC, obviously the contractors have access to the information, they're going to run reports on it, you're just doing a much easier and much more efficient process. Uh, question here from Thomas Shigley. Um, how, is it e uh, how easy is it to migrate from another document management system to eDocs? Um, David, I'll open this one up to you guys since you guys did it on this particular project going from the FTP HDR system to eDocs. Um, you know, how much effort was involved there? It, it was a significant effort there because we had to take all the documents from that have been uh, communicated or transmitted to us from the FTP site to uh, we had to then upload them to EA dot, and we did that within within uh, the field office ourselves, where we would uh, just just for documentation we would take the for example the final approved uh, shop drawing and upload that to EA dot, and it's it's made available to the engineer owner and contractor, but it it took time to do that. That's why early implementation is a is a key to success. Yeah, we definitely, Thomas, we definitely urge people to start the system anywhere from project conception up until just before you start construction. Um, those are optimal time periods to implement the tool. Um, you know, we've got clients that are using it throughout the design phase now to track all the design information, so this way it's all there ready to go, and when they go to construction, they're just adding the contractors and enabling that new functionality. But definitely earlier is better with these tools, uh, which is a very challenge in this industry. Um, a lot of times CMs get their contracts after the general contractor does. Um, so a lot of times they are having to play catch up um, and migrate data from owner's tools or whatever the owner's been using to track that information if they have been tracking it at all. Um, you know, in, in terms of the, the actual amount of work, <coughs> it's going to depend on how you're tracking that information. You know, for David's group, they had it organized on FTP sites and an existing system, so they had good detailed records. Um, it's just a matter of moving it into our tool. Um, for some other teams that we've migrated, you know, they've had data spread out on multiple laptops, multiple FTP sites. There was a fair amount of effort involved with that. Um, so it really depends on what you're currently using and what you're migrating to. Let's see, uh, Roger Charles, um, tech help is vital when using systems such as EDOC. Um, absolutely. Um, so his question is, how much is included versus required to buy from EDOCs? So tech support is included with our subscription. Uh, it's not an option. It's always included with the subscription and it's available to the entire project team. 
Uh, so, you know, David used it for his team, and they were calling a support request for configuration and setup and training. And then uh, any of those project participants could file requests as well. So, if the contractor had an issue adding a sub, they can contact us directly. Um, if one of the subs needed assistance submitting a submittal or using an application, they can contact us directly. Um, it's all built into the application. It's available through the application itself. You don't have to log into a separate site, and it's included with the subscription uh, for our project uh, for our clients. Uh, so that's the final question that's here on the system. Um, we've got about three more minutes left here on the presentation. I can still see there's about 83 people logged on. Um, so if anybody else wants to go ahead and file questions, go ahead. We'll keep it open here as long as the questions keep coming in. Just got one more. Uh, before Joe kicks us off. Okay. Uh, Linnea Gallagher, does EDOC also track email and other communications that are considered less formal? Uh, so typically with our system, we use email out of the software to users as a notification mechanism. Um, we have a memos module for tracking the communication in the tool. And we really try and get users to break that habit of tracking emails. And the big challenge with emails is it's very easy and convenient to fire off an email. The downside of emails is the accountability. You know, when you send off an email, um, you don't know, you know, which project it's going against unless you type that in the text in the body. You don't have a log of, you know, who's going to read it, who's going to respond to it. You lose a lot of that accounting and benefit, and it's tough to link and relate to other information without a lot of labor. So what we try and urge clients to do is not use emails for any type of project communication, whether it's formal or informal. All their project communication should go through our application, so you've got those detailed records. You can set up different functionalities. You can say, hey, here's our formal communication mechanism inside EDOC. Here's our informal communication mechanism. So this way users know what's important and what's not. Uh, you can do all that for it. Um, and so that's what we urge our clients to do is, you know, email is great because it's easy to use, but the downsides are huge. Um, there's a couple cases that we're aware of, um, not involving our software, but involving email systems where contractors and clients are going through the discovery process. And recently, a contractor was required to turn over their entire email server because they could not differentiate which emails went to the project that the claim was involved to, um, which is bad for both parties because the owner received, I believe it was 6 million emails from the contractor, and the owner had to sort through those, their legal team, to pick out which emails they needed in the discovery case. And the contractor had to turn over their entire email system to an owner. And 90% of those emails probably were not related to the project or the claim. Um, so you have to be very careful with email um, communication because it is discoverable, and you want to make sure it's tracked against the project. And so we urge our clients not to use it for project communication because you lack that accountability, that tie to the project. And Eric, uh, we have used email, and, and there's a tab in our in our in our application where we can upload an email that is sent through you know the company email, and yep. we are able to link that to another document. You know whether it's a a change order or a shop drawing or whatever that is. So we we have used that application somewhat uh, somewhat different you know, using company <laughs> emails. Right. We recognize we won't be able to get everybody to break the email habit. You know, it's been too ingrained in everybody for so long. Uh, the next question from uh, Thomas: uh, What does this cost for a subscription? Uh, so I'll point you to our website. We've got some cost samples on there for you that you can take a look at, the www.eadocsoftware.com. Uh, there's a cost comparison page um, that you can take a look at. Um, the subscription is based on the construction value of the project. Um, so this way, as the project dollars go up, the subscription increases because obviously you're going to have more users, more data, more duration for you guys. Um, and I'd be happy to take more questions and stuff. You can contact me directly um, after this presentation. Uh, my email address is eric.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law.law
All right. Um, let's see. Uh, not seeing any more questions. Uh, thank you, David and Eric, very much for a fantastic presentation. Um, as he mentioned earlier, if you guys have any questions, I believe both Eric and David have been kind enough to provide their contact info for you guys. Um, and if you guys need anything from CMAA, feel free to reach out to me. Um, thanks, everybody, for participating in today's webinar. Uh, be sure to complete the attendance form within the next two days if you're seeking continuing education credits. Uh, thanks, everybody, and have a good day. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Joe.